Today we're taking a look at American Wasteland, which is the favorite of a lot of you guys in the comments. Is it really that good? Let's take a look. Welcome to Rad Rat Video. Here on the channel, we learn something new about skateboarding three times a week. I talk about all kinds of skateboarding topics like trick histories, I answer all of your questions on my series Ask Rad Rat, and I do game reviews of classic and obscure skateboarding games. Today we are talking about American Wasteland on the Xbox. We finally made it. A lot of you guys have been asking me to do this game and we finally got to it. Um, also, a lot of you guys have been requesting Project 8. So keep in mind, I'm doing the entire series in order, so there's really no need to request your favorite. I will get to it eventually. The only ones that are out of order are Downhill Jam and Tony Hawk HD, which I reviewed already before restarting the series. Okay, so let's get into American Wasteland. This is the seventh game in the series and the fifth on the PS2 and the Xbox. At this point, this series is starting to outgrow its engine. They packed a ton of new stuff in here, some that doesn't last very long in the series, and they did their absolute best to make the game feel like it's open world. To accomplish all that stuff, they had to downgrade the resolution of the Xbox version from 720 to 480p. Of course, I can't really recommend the Xbox version anymore this late in the series because the controls are just way too complicated. Let's talk about some of the new additions. So here are the new tricks that they added into this game. The first few hours of this game are just tutorials. There's so much new stuff that it takes forever just to get up to speed. First is the parkour stuff. So you've got double jumps, wall runs, backflips, and of course you learn all this from a French pastry chef because, you know, parkour is French. Next up is the bank drops. They really expanded on the like acid drop, spine drop type of stuff in this game, and they put in a lot of these banks, like store signs, sandwich boards, all that kind of stuff. You can spine transfer over it, and then also revert, which is different from a regular revert. You've also got additional plants. So there are sticker slaps, but now there are wall plants on just normal walls and on vert, and you can also boneless out of a wall ride. Also on vert, you can do a two-tail, which looks like this. There are a couple more, like stalls on random stuff. You can hold the right trigger, and when you do a grind, you'll stall. Aside from the couple of times in the story you have to do it, you'll never do this on purpose, but you'll do it a lot on accident, though. You can hold the trigger to spin, and then if you don't let go on time, you'll stall out on the rail when you try to grind. I don't really understand this addition to the game. It's not like you can just choose for a grind and not work and just stall instead. And if you could, I don't know why you'd want to. They also added Burt Slides. Again, you'll do this in the story mode, maybe a couple of times on accident, but has very little actual use in the game. The trick is a Burt or Bertleman slide, which is a real trick from back in the day. I can see why they wanted to add this in, but it's just kind of there. And on the Xbox, it uses up the trigger, which makes nollies really annoying since they get mapped to the white button. One of the biggest changes though is the new animation system. There are some pros and cons to it, but in general, I think it's a step up. The 360 hard flip is finally fixed. Yeah, it's really vertical, which nobody really does, but at least it's not wrong anymore. 360 inward heels have become vertical too, which is a little weird, but there are two really messed up changes though. First is the nollie flips. If you do a double or a triple, your arm goes crazy and it looks like you have to really throw it to get it around. The other problem is the double and triple flip animations in every stance. Sometimes they just don't flip. Most of the time they look right, but every now and then they don't flip enough and they just go really slow. This is something that bothered me when the game came out and it's still really annoying. I just don't get why they did this. The animation in this game is not based on physics or anything auto-generated, it was done by hand. So somebody actually made a really slow kickflip animation for some reason. They also added in boned ollies. It helps you get a little bit more height like a boneless, but you can hold it like a grab. It's not worth as many points as an actual grab though. You'll do this in challenges a couple of times. They added in spin directions to this new system, and of course, it has half cabs wrong. Every game has either nolly or fakie wrong because they're opposites. I have a video about that that you can check out on screen right now. It really doesn't make sense, but that's how it is, and I've yet to see a game that actually does it right. They also added in bikes. There have been a lot of vehicles over the course of this series, including really weird stuff like a mechanical bull, but this time, the bike stuff is actually pretty well thought out, and that's because it's based off of Matt Hoffman. So the controls actually match that series instead of playing like Tony Hawk. 
you do bar spins and tail whoops with the right stick, and you hold the left trigger to do flips and stuff. It feels good, but I didn't really get into these challenges that much. They're all really simple and not that interesting. But it is cool that you have the option to ride around on a bike whenever you want. But it's kind of annoying. Sometimes you have to be on a bike to start a bike challenge. If you look for the icon on your radar, you can go jump on it. But look at this one. It's a bike challenge, but you have to be on a skateboard. And then you get on a bike when it starts. And they just made the timer a little bit longer to make up for the animation of you getting on the bike. It just feels really sloppy the way they set this up. The last new thing I want to cover is the open world design. If you couldn't hear the air quotes around open world, there were three or four. What they did was make the different levels connect in different ways. So you have to ride through a hallway or a ditch or something like that to get to the next area. And as you skate through it, the game not so subtly loads the next level. From a gameplay perspective, that makes sense. You can unlock an event in another area, but still play where you are and skate for a while. In Thug 1 and 2, it would just take you to the next level in a cutscene. So it's definitely a good idea, but I think they were just way too proud of it. There are a lot of times when you have to hurry up and get back to Hollywood or East LA or whatever. You're running from the cops or trying to beat someone to a spot. It works and it's an impressive feat on the PS2 especially, but it's not fun. These corridors you skate through are just really plain. So I think that's pretty much it for the new features in this game. There are a lot and it seems like a lot of times you can end up doing something you don't expect. So you either accidentally double tap something or you hit A when you weren't planning on it. Next thing you know, you're flying in the wrong direction because of some obscure move. So it can be kind of annoying juggling all these new features, but you do get used to it. The game has two main modes, just like the last one, story mode and classic mode. Let's take a quick look at classic mode. This is the way I started with the game. In my Thug 2 review, I mentioned that this was more of an afterthought, but after finishing the story mode, I realized that there's actually quite a bit of fresh content here but it's a lot shorter than Thug 2's classic mode at six levels instead of nine. The ones that are returning are Downtown from Pro Skater 1, which it renames Minneapolis. There's another Downtown level in the story here, so it makes sense they had to change it. You also get the Mall from Pro Skater 1 and Chicago too. Chicago is kind of interesting. So keep in mind, this was made at a time you couldn't even do manuals yet. And here I am collecting stuff by getting off my board and climbing up the wall. That made the level feel a lot fresher, especially considering that this was originally a contest level. So there's nothing that feels too recycled here. Aside from that, you've got three new levels, assuming you've only been playing the console versions like me so far, starting with Santa Cruz. This level has a lot in common with Santa Monica in the story mode. I think they probably reused some of the assets from the pier area and some other stuff. It still feels pretty unique though, but it doesn't play that well as a classic level. It's the same problem as a Thug 2 Classic Mode. These levels are just too big. There's a ton of space to cover to try to find the skate letters and all the other goals. There are so many nooks and crannies that stuff can be hiding anywhere. And here's the thing, this isn't a classic level. This was actually taken from Tony Hawk's Underground 2 Remix on the PSP. And it's not the only one. Kyoto was in Thug 2 Remix first as well. This level is, again, a bit too big to be a classic level. It took me forever to find all the arcade machines I was supposed to smash and look for all the other things too. Lastly is the Ruins. This level seems to have a lot in common with the East LA level in the main story, but it's actually taken from Tony Hawk's Project 8 on the PSP. I mean, it is the ruins of LA, so I guess it makes sense that it would feel the same, but this time I think the American Wasteland level came first and that this was taken from it. Also, there's a collector's edition on the PS2 which has a couple of extra levels, namely Marseille from Pro Skater 2 and Atlanta, which was from Thug 2 Remix. I'll have to play these at some point, but I'm sure there aren't any major surprises. But in any case, you know how this mode works. You get skate letters, high scores, and collect stuff. At this point in the series, this is really starting to wear on me. But I'm not necessarily sick of it. I think I could go back and play Pro Skater 2 or 3 and have a great time. But it's just something about the way that this feels that it doesn't work right anymore. I just think it's the fact that there's so much going on that's ignored. Especially this version. Because you never see the story mode challenges that take place in these levels. Like that giant crater. Why is it there? It's just random meaningless decoration at this point. And this goes unexplained in the game. But apparently, in Thug 2 Remix, there's a giant fight between Godzilla and Ultraman, and that's what caused this. I really have to check that game out. I played it back in the day, but I don't remember any of this stuff. So that's why this mode fails. 
Not because it's bad or it's broken, but just because it doesn't have that handmade feel that the original games had. It's worth checking out at least, but it's not the biggest draw of the game. Let's take a look at the story mode. I'm not going to go in extreme detail here because there's a lot to cover, but I'll talk about the main points at least. When you start the game, you pick from one of five skaters that just moved to LA. It's weird that you can't just make them from scratch like every other game. There's enough customization that it's not a big deal, but I didn't see anyone I really liked and it ended up being this army looking guy. You meet Mindy who wants to start a skating magazine called American Wasteland, and she helps you get into this skate ranch. And you do that by gaining everyone's approval. This is probably the biggest theme in the game, just getting approval and proving you're legit. You do it here, you do it with a skate gang later, with a graffiti gang, and with other pro skaters at the end. And of course, you gain approval by doing tricks. At first, it's just training stuff. You learn how to do wall flips and nada spins and all that other kind of stuff I talked about earlier. And once you can do everything that those guys can do, you're in. The skate ranch is the main goal of the game. You help finish a vert ramp that they're working on, and next thing you know, you're going all over the game world, finding stuff to break, steal, and take back to the ranch. Once it gets there, you can go back to the ranch and then break stuff in. You can see how the piece was installed at the park, and then you have to get a high score on it. It's always really easy, but the point of these challenges is just to make sure you see it all and that you get a chance to skate it. And this part is pretty cool, but since there's only one Mindy, you have to do them all in order. Break one in and the next one appears, repeated a couple of dozen times until she finally stops popping back up on the radar. Apparently, the guy who runs the ranch, Iggy, is a wanted felon and eventually you accidentally out him and that gets him arrested. So you have to figure out how to get him out. While working on that, you have to join the skate club. These guys are anti-corporate greed and materialism, so to impress them, you have to take off your shirt and your shoes and do freestyle tricks in a parking garage. Bet you didn't see that coming. This event is actually pretty cool though. The camera moves around and gives you some interesting angles. Since all you really need to worry about is a balance meter, it doesn't cause any problems and it looks cool. Once you beat them all, you have to beat the best freestyler around. Any guesses who it might be? So think about it, who's the best freestyle skater that's ever been in a Tony Hawk game? That's right, Daywon Song, wait, what? Yeah, it's it's a little weird, but they use Mullen later to show you how to invent tricks, and that makes a lot of sense, too. You later meet Tony Alva and find out about a legendary skate park buried under the skate ranch, and you start the process of digging it up by doing a lot of favors for guys on an oil rig. Yeah, this is actually the same oil rig that was exclusive to Tony Hawk 3 on the Xbox. It's got some changes to it and a lot of challenges. One thing I like about these challenges now is these little pop-ups. So when you go to grind something and do a certain gap, it's always very clear what you're supposed to do. You don't have to worry about accidentally skipping a cutscene and not knowing what's going on. After that, you have to get to East LA to help Boone, who got in trouble with his old gang. To help him, you actually join that gang. And to prove you're legit, you have to go do skate missions, BMX missions, and of course, tagging. Again, tagging is really important in this game and I just don't like it. I know it was cool at the time that you could tag something and the game would remember where it was, but that isn't exactly impressive these days. Alright, so to prove yourself in the gang, you have to help this guy finish tags all over the game world, and when you get enough, he teaches you the trademark style of that area. Then you need to make a tag with every style included in it. Up until this point, I had just been ignoring that guy, but now I didn't have a choice, and that kind of sucked. This is one of the ways that the game forces pacing. You can't just do the story stuff and beat the game right away. Another example is getting to the oil rig from earlier. You need gas money for the boat. Don't have enough money? Better go do some more challenges. Or can't afford that tattoo to go join the gang? Better go do some more challenges. Luckily, this really rich bum loves to give you money to do mini challenges like doing the tricks he calls out or finding gaps. It was a pretty good idea to pace the game out like this to make sure people see everything there is to see. It was just kind of annoying when it was the tag and BMX stuff that I wasn't really into. Anyway, you get Boone out, Iggy gets bail, and then he punches you in the face for digging up the skate park. Apparently, he knew it was there, but he didn't own the land yet. He was saving up to buy it, but now that everyone knows about that skate park, the price is going to go through the roof. Luckily, there's a plan. You get a bunch of skaters together and film a video to sell, and the proceeds will go to buy the land and finish the skate park. But, how do you convince pro skaters to help you out? I think you already know, you have to prove yourself, most of the time at least. Ryan Sheckler wants you to help him steal a Jeep. Sick! 
This thing's gonna look perfect sitting next to my other 10 cars. What a tool. The one with Tony Hawk is actually kind of funny. You insult him for blowing thousands of dollars shopping on Rodeo Drive, and he has to show you that he can still skate. So he shows you some of the tricks he invented, including the hurricane, which apparently he invented too. I didn't know that one. Oh, and get this. A 900. Dave? Two and a half spinner, invented in 99. Best vert trick ever. You execute it flawlessly on a regular basis. Tony does 900s on the regular. I didn't know that either. Anyway, the video these guys help film is such a huge success that you buy the ranch with pre-order money alone. The game ends with a dramatic chase scene with the police that goes through all of the loading zones. Yeah, these aren't fun normally, and trying to get through everything with a timer in the dark doesn't make it any better, but it was dramatic at least. You get that done, and you finally get the girl, and then you pay to get her magazine project off the ground. So that's the story mode. With all the new innovations in the gameplay, there aren't a ton of new challenge types to talk about, but there don't really need to be. This game has a lot going for it as is, and it's probably the longest game I've played in the series so far, as you can probably tell from the runtime of this video. So is this game any good? Yeah, I, I think it is. I really like the feel of the game. I think the story is really interesting and cool by Tony Hawk standards. Things can get a bit repetitive here and there, but it does throw enough new stuff at you as you go that it keeps you entertained as well. So I think you'll have a really good time if you pick this one up. But what version should you get? I'd probably say the PS2 version, but there's actually a surprise contender this time, the Xbox 360. So yeah, there's a 360 version of this game, making it the first next-gen Tony Hawk game from that period. I don't have a 360 and I haven't had a chance to play it, so if you do and you've played it before, let me know what it's like in the comments. Apparently it uses all the same uh, 3D models and the assets and stuff from this version, but the textures are a little bit better, uh, it's a little clearer, the lights are a little better, some of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's probably the version to go with if, if your 360 still works, but if it doesn't, you're not missing out on anything going with the PS2. So. Let me know what your experiences are with this game in general and whatever version it is. Is it your favorite? Um, I've been seeing in the comments a lot of you guys say that this one is the best. And I can't really agree because I think it's just bloated with so many different tricks and features at this point. But it's definitely not bad. So next up in my Tony Hawk game review series will be Project 8. And this will take me a little while probably because there are two different versions. There's the PS3 version and the original Xbox version, and they're pretty different, so I'm going to have to cover them separately. Haven't had to deal with that since Pro Skater 4. Oh, and there's also a PSP version too, but I'm going to have to get to that some of the time. But to make sure you don't miss out on that review, hit the subscribe button right here on the screen. You'll learn something new about skateboarding three times a week, and you'll get all kinds of fresh content like this stuff right here on screen. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.